What are you doing? Yeah, no? Woo! <laughs> All right, today we have a special treat for you guys. We're gonna have an immigration workshop, and today we have Rebel Diaz, which is Rod Stars, and G, along with uh, John Jay alumni and current teaching professor, Professor Claudia De La Cruz. And this event, this event is part of a semester-long initiative to raise awareness to immigration and deportation, and um. And additionally, I wanted to know um, to let you guys know that there's a poetry contest, and uh, the deadline is coming up soon. So, um, so if you are interested in submitting uh, a poet, a poem, there's information about the poetry contest in the back. And uh, first place prize is two hundred dollars, and then um, second place is a hundred dollars, and then there's three prizes, uh, four prizes for fifty dollars. So for more information, there's a flyer in the back. All right. So I guess we're gonna give the mic over to Rebel Diaz. What's up, y'all? When I say people, y'all say power. People! Power! When I say people, y'all say power. People! Power! Right. See, I gotta draw a line. I can't take it no more. We need you to you use that mic. revolution. What, what you waiting for? Making money for suckers and our communities poor. Ripping flags off of carpets. Man, this ain't our war. Colonized and terrorized by the world's biggest killers. The U.S. government, the biggest weapon in drug dealers. Filling prisons with children, incarcerating the future. MySpace to Facebook, got stuck on computers. Stuck on stupid bumping music that's abusive to the shortest. The nonsense that they spitting, we just listen and absorb it. I've been dormant, I'm awoke, I'm a giant, I'm ready. I'm with the op, when we're hot, can we hold the machetes? I rock hard like Palestinian children holding slingshots. Shots with every single kid that's down for hip hop. Hot the culture, the life, what it really stands for. This music is resistance, it's the voice of the poor. On the side of the workers, the teachers, and lunch ladies. On the streets of brown mommies raising now brown babies. I'm with youth organized, cleaning up the Bronx River. Kai Miskal out there when I stand and deliver. I'm with Airborne Morales, man, he brought in Bolivia. Distribution of the land so we can all live bigger. I'm with Ugo and Fidel, Grandmaster of Melly Mel. With the Panthers up in Queens, justice for Sean Bell. I'm with Camacho Negron, I'm with Ojeda Rios. Freedom for Oscar Lopez, time to get an appeal. I'm with Abu Jamal, I'm with Asada Shakur. I'm with the Compas in the Mokali, getting a penny more. Now, which, which side, side are you on? Sha City, yeah. yeah. which side are you on? The South Bronx. Come on, which side are you on? The Brooklyn. Yeah. Which side are you on? I'm with the students. What's up, y'all? When we say people, y'all say power. People! Power. What's up, y'all? How y'all doing? I didn't want us to use the microphones. Because they like recording. So Peace out. My name is G1. My name is Rod Stars, and we are Rebel Diaz. Um, and we want to talk to y'all about hip hop and immigration. So we're going to get right to it. Um, and basically, what we want to do more than anything is put hip hop in its historical context. All right? So, but more, you know, I know y'all be having lectures and midterms and all that. I don't want y'all to feel like this is a class. Consider this like a cipher. Like you at home in the living room chilling with your cousins and your family, and you're just having a conversation. So if you feel at any moment you want to participate, you got a comment, feel free to put your hand up and we'll make it happen. All right, y'all with that? Okay. So hip hop emerges in a post civil rights era. Who's the brother up here on the left? All right, Malcolm X. What happened to Malcolm? Uh, he got killed. Who's this here on the bottom? All right, what happened to Mario? I, I can sit here and show you pictures of Chairman Fred Hampton, a bunch of Carter, and a whole bunch of other folks that got assassinated. And we gonna keep it short and let just get the point across. Hip hop emerges in a historical moment in which there was a void of leadership in our communities because the leadership had been assassinated, killed, tortured, murdered. You know what I'm saying? Disappeared. And this is the social setting in which hip hop is born into. You know what I'm saying? In which communities have been attacked. You know what I'm saying? By the FBI, by prisons, by police, by COINTELPRO, right? Counterintelligence programs that were meant to shut down the rise of any black or brown messiah. Okay? So this is the hip hop, the context that hip hop is born into. Alright, so uh, where were y'all born? What decade? Most of y'all, students. 90s, 90s. alright? So hip hop emerges in the South Bronx where we currently reside. Uh, in the decade of the 70s, and during this time, the South Bronx was burning. Raise your hand if you ever heard that term before. Nah? Alright. Why, why would the South Bronx be burning during this time? 
Anybody? Was it a particularly hot summer? What happened? Absentee landlords. They burnt, they burnt it down. Who's there? The government? Okay, close. My brother in the back said absentee landlords. All right, there you okay. go. Definitely. What else? The people? Okay, that's the answer. All right, so the South Bronx was traditionally an immigrant community, but initially there was immigrants not like we see today in the South Bronx. Initially we had Irish immigrants in the South Bronx, Italian immigrants in the South Bronx, Dutch immigrants in the South Bronx. And in the 1950s, something starts to happen. Y'all ever heard of the term white flight? Yeah. All right? The American dream, the suburbs, white picket fence, making it in America. Okay, so a lot of these initial immigrants start to move out. And a new immigrant wave comes in uh, that's predominantly Afro-Caribbean uh, immigration. Okay, and this is in around the late 50s, 60s, going into the 70s. And so what happens when this new immigrant population comes into the Bronx? Y'all yeah, heard of redlining? All right, so the inherent racism in, in real estate practices, right, that we see throughout all the urban areas throughout the United States. And so unfortunately, the property value goes down. Coupled with disinvestment by the city government, you have a total of 40,000 fires. You can go back real quick to the previous one. Put the middle arrow to the left. There you go. So you see these fires. You see how the, the South Bronx looked during this time. It, can, it looks like uh, Iraq or maybe even modern day uh, Detroit. And at the bottom here you have Jimmy Carter, the president at the time, who commented. And this, actually, this picture is on the same corner where today we run a storefront community center in the South Bronx. But the South Bronx was burning because these real estate, the absentee land, who said the absentee land? Who said that? My man in the back, okay? They started burning down their own buildings because the property value went down so much that they figured, hey, we're going to burn down these buildings and collect the insurance money as opposed to upkeeping these buildings and taking care of them for the new immigrant populations that are coming in. So the result is this, these type of images. And what we're trying to do here is kind of set the stage, set the setting uh, so we can see in the context in which hip-hop emerges. All right, the South Bronx was an immigrant community. So when we talk about Afro-Caribbean population, we talk about Jamaicans, Haitians, Puerto Ricans, right, Cubans. Dominicans mainly came a little bit later, but there was still Dominicans involved, you feel me? Um, but more than anything, when we talk about hip-hop, we have to understand that if hip-hop comes from an immigrant community, then without immigration, hip-hop wouldn't exist. Plain and simple, you know what I'm saying? Um, if there's anything that I want y'all to take home with that is that, is that hip-hop is an immigrant culture. You know what I'm saying? It's a culture that comes from conditions of poverty, like you see up here. Conditions of, you know, uh, being systematically ignored. You know what I'm saying? The idea that the Bronx was the burned down borough, but it was also the forgotten borough. In a stage uh, in which art programs have been cut down. You know what I'm saying? In which music programs, uh, I've had a lot of elders tell me, man, in the 50s and 60s it was common to see young black children and young brown children walking down the street with a trumpet or a trombone, you know what I'm saying? Those music programs are cut, okay? So when we talk about hip hop and immigration, we have to understand that hip hop is immigration and immigration is hip hop, you feel me? All right, next one. Robert Moses. Do we have any urban planners in the house? You've never heard of Robert Moses. Never heard of him. Oh my God. You're going to learn today. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Robert Moses. Robert Moses. Speak into the mic, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Man. I feel like I'm about to do a show with rapping right here. All right. So um, Robert Moses is one of the foremost uh, city planners here in New York City, uh, responsible for a lot, of the inf a lot of infrastructure that was created in the 20th century here in New York. Uh, but one of the things he's responsible for uh, is these tall project buildings that we see all over New York City, all right? Project buildings that are often surrounded or even have a precinct right in the same premises as the project building. So one of the uh, city planning policies that he put forth was the development of these high-rise buildings, public housing, uh, and really the idea of containing poor people giving housing to low-income people and stacking them on top of each other in a space where they can be easily contained and policed, all right? So 
That's one of the things that are uh, one of the legacies of Robert Moses. But he has something else. The building at a Cross Bronx Expressway. What in the world? Is now, what the hell does a Cross Bronx Expressway got to do with hip hop and immigration? We're going to talk a little bit about that. We want to kind of, by doing that, we want to get y'all bluff from, so we're going to make y'all move a little bit. But I'm, I'm going to break it down why. So, my brother Irvin, right here, right? We're going to say this whole first row, y'all going to be representing my Jamaicans. Y'all with that? Okay, so for now, y'all are the Jamaican community. Okay? What's your name in the back of this, sister? What's your name? Lily Beth. So Lily Beth and her peoples right here, they're going to represent the Boricua community, the Puerto Rican community, all right? All right? What's your, what's your name, brother? I know. Uh, what's your name, man? Okay, so Fran Julio. All right, so Fran Julio, you will be part of the Garifuna community, which is the Afro-Caribbean part of Guatemala, Honduras, Belize, okay? You're going to rep that part of the Bronx, okay? So we got Jamaicans, we got our, our, our Boricuas, our Puerto Ricans, our Garifuna. Now this side right here, this row right here, y'all gonna represent my Haitian community, okay? Y'all gonna be the Haitian immigrants. And over here, we gonna have some of the leftover, you know what I'm saying, European immigrants. We gonna have some folks, you know what I'm saying, the black community that, that came from the South. We gonna have this right here. But guess what? Y'all gotta move because we building the Cross Bronx Expressway in your hood. So I need y'all to get up and go over there. I'm not even playing with y'all. On the real. Get up. Get up. You gotta bounce. Your neighborhood is your neighborhood is being taken out. We building a highway. Lily Beth, you gotta go. You and your Puerto Rican friends gotta move. From Julio, Rafael, from Julio, you and your friends gotta move, dude. There's a highway going through your community. It is time for you to move. Y'all was getting comfortable with food and little juices and water, but you got to go because the highway got to be built. Now, the purpose of this highway, yep. okay, find some space. You got to sit down, whatever, figure it out. Find some, house, find some housing. The purpose of this highway, right, was to give quicker access, okay, for those folks that had left areas like the Bronx, for folks that were living perhaps in New Jersey or Upper Westchester, so that they can have a quicker route to get to work, okay? Completely devastated communities in the South Bronx. Some things happened, though, during this move. What are some things that happened? Say it out loud. I hear y'all saying something. Go ahead, say it out loud. There's a what? There's a mix, okay? Mix different people. What else? I feel like Ms. Bettina here said she didn't have enough elbow room anymore. What else? Less living space, what else? Some people are standing, shoot, some people don't got a living space, right? What else? Anybody else? What? Okay. okay. Definitely, those are all wonderful answers. Anybody? What about the folks that were already here, that were on this side? How do y'all feel with everybody coming over? Huh, y'all mad? They mad? You said that they mad, huh? Uh, all right, all right. <laughs> you didn't your hood, okay? <laughs> what else? Okay, so the building of the Cross Bonds Expressway indirectly, indirectly leads to this condition where communities that had been traditionally segregated and separated are forced to come together. Now, there's some good and some bad that comes out of that. All right? So there's you know, a lot of the ethnic rivalries that emerged and the ethnic gangs that came up. All right? Have you ever seen the Hollywood version of this story in the movie Warriors? Right? But this idea of different ethnic gangs, different ethnic tensions arising from mix of people coming together that had previously not been together. Uh, but a lot of wonderful things also happened, all right? And my man, uh, somebody said it earlier, the idea of different cultures coming together as well. Um, and again, this is another fact, not obviously the only factor, but this building of this cross Bronx Expressway is one of the factors that leads to creating the conditions for what emerges uh, as hip hop culture. Cool? Y'all can go back to your hood, y'all Y'all can go back to your hood. If you want to stay on this side, you're good too. And so we see on this map here, we'll see also, this shows y'all familiar with the, with the Bronx, uh, but that's the Cross Bronx Expressway pretty much cuts straight through the middle of the Bronx. Um, it's also one of the reasons why we have the highest asthma rates um, in all of the country uh, because of this increased truck traffic that occurs um, 
All right, so there you have an image. So you see, this is not a small highway that was built, okay? And what you also see at the same time is, the, is just the fact that systematically, they don't care about poor people. Let's just build a highway. Who cares about them kids having asthma? Who cares about, you know what I'm saying, them drink, you know, breathing exhaust fumes all day because of all the trucks that pass through their area? So things to think about, too, how, you know, inadvertently by bringing all these cultures together, a lot of that energy ended up being what led to a beautiful culture like hip hop being created. All right, Jamaican boy DJ Cool Herc. This year, August 11th of 19, I'm sorry, this year, August 11th of 2013, we celebrated the 40th anniversary of hip hop. All right, the first party was thrown August 11th um, in the rec center, 1520 Cedric Ave, in, the, in, in basically uh, a back to school party that his younger sister, 16 year old Cindy Campbell, was like, yo, big brother Herc, I need you to throw me a party because I need some new school clothes. I got them fresh. So he threw it. Party was like 15 cents for the fellas, you know what I'm saying, 10 cents for the ladies. But more than anything, it lit, it lit the match for what we call hip hop today. And that match was lit by a brother that was from Jamaica. And what he brought to the table was the Jamaican sound system tradition, yes. okay? Look at how big these speakers are. This dude is at least Maybe six feet tall, you know what I'm saying? So, go figure, pretty huge, all right? And a lot of times, when you look at what this comes from, it's a sound system tradition that was rich in Jamaica and that was especially seen during the times of elections, right? What's your name in the back, my G, right there? Rob. Rob? All right, so Rob, what's, what's, what's your name, sis? No. So Rob and Janelle, even though they're sitting together right now, we gonna say for this purpose, that they are running against each other for mayor, okay? So Janelle, she shows up, she got speakers like the one we got here today. She's doing her thing, she got a little food for the people. People are feeling good. Now Rob shows up across the street with the Jamaican sound system tradition. <laughs> what you think is gonna happen? People might leave your party, you know what I mean? And, and that, that's, in, in essence, is what Cool Herc brought to the table. His father was a DJ. You know what I'm saying? A Jamaican DJ. And Herc started doing something different. He started cutting up the breaks. And the break of a record was the instrumental part, the drumming with a drummer. Y'all ever heard when James Brown is, can the drummer have some, y'all? Can the drummer have some, y'all, right? When the drummer was going in, that percussive break is what Cool Herc started bringing to the table. He, they called it the merry-go-round. And he would basically loop the drum beat. You know what I'm saying? And this is what leads to what we call hip hop today. So, Herc started doing these parties in the rec center, but also, they took the party outside. What, what, what stands out to y'all from this picture here? The fan, definitely the fan. This whole mess of wires going on right here, all right? These dudes is modern day MacGyver's, ghetto scientists. They got the fan <laughs> cooling down the, the amplifier so it doesn't burn out, okay? What about electricity? Where are they getting electricity from? The lamppost. They ain't got no expensive generator. How about, uh, uh, what is this, sound permit, uh, assembly permit? Uh, do we need that? Man, no, man, no, none of that, none of that, okay? So hip hop emerges in a space where they're taking over public space, all right? Taking over public space where it's not being sanctioned by the state, not being sanctioned by the police, and it's a public space that's open Okay, to young people, to elders, to the babies, okay? Um, and that's what we start to see uh, emerging in hip hop culture, as a party culture, as an outdoor public space uh, being taken over for the purposes of providing culture to the community. And when we talk about immigrant cultures, you know, some of the images that we saw earlier, the guy that was, the, the couple dancing salsa outside, or the guy that was playing the conga drum, a lot of of that immigrant influence was that the idea of being outside. You know what I mean? Like a lot of times here, there's the concept of that you have to be locked inside your house and you know you don't even know your neighbor's name. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of times when you look at the, the beginnings of hip hop, it was very much about community. Like Herc, we were so we had the, the, the pleasure of talking to DJ Cool Herc this summer. And one of the main things that we that he told us was, yo, the first hip hop parties weren't just young people, it wasn't teenagers. It was grandmas, aunties, uncles, little kids and strollers. It was a whole community thing, you know? So when we look at, at hip hop in the park, 
It was something that was accessible. It was culture that was accessible to the whole community. It wasn't the idea of paying $200 to go see Jay-Z and Eminem perform at Yankee Stadium. You know what I'm saying? It was the idea of culture being accessible to the community before there was a price on it. Puerto Rican B-Boys. So while Herc was cutting up the breaks, this percussive break in, in these funk and soul records, it became time for the B-Boys and B-Girls, and that should say B-Boys and B-Girls. Shout out to the, to the, to the lady B-Girls, all right? Um, but y'all heard her break dancing? So it's not called break dancing because you break your bones or none of that. It's called break dancing, right, because this, was a t this dance emerged during the time the DJs were playing the percussive break and looplessly, see, seamlessly looping the percussive break in funk records, okay? So that's, that was the time when the B-Boys and B-Girls came out and did their thing. Um, a lot of the B-Boys and B-Girls were predominantly Puerto Rican. I know that, that Rod got his start in hip-hop in, coming in as a B-Boy, right? Um, but the influences that, that, that B-Boy and B-Girl had uh, are many, but we're going to show one quick example uh, just to show the connection. This, this following clip is from an amazing documentary called From Mambo to Hip Hop. Uh, and what we're going to see is how some of the Mambo dances of the 50s and 60s influenced uh, the B Boys and B Girl techniques that emerged uh, later in the 70s and 80s. So we're going to play without any sound um, and just to see y'all can see the images. What's happening now? When I look at some of the old footage of some of, like, for instance, in Marvel. You see the Marvel, right? Boom, he's already on the floor. This is the 50s. Yeah. 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 You know, all these boys in the 80s. Yeah. 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 pioneers in the Bronx, um, and, and then, you know, obviously let us know as well that it goes even further back. We can look at some uh, ceremonies, native ceremonies, and African traditions, um, and the influence of capoeira from Brazil, and the influence also of some of the kung fu movies that were popular at the time, okay? So all of these things influence and lead to what we have uh, today as b boy and b girl. When we look at hip-hop, right, we when we look at hip hop, I'm not used to doing the workshop with the mic. I'm sorry. Like, I'm, I'm not used to rapping when I get the mic. All right, so when we look at hip hop, we also want to understand and leave here that hip hop culture is something that we're going to keep completely separate from the corporate driven rap music industry. Okay, so just so that we're clear on that, what we're talking about today is hip hop culture. Um, hip hop culture consisting of five elements, right? The MC, okay? The DJ. The B-boy and B-girl. The fourth one is the one that you see most visually, the aesthetic of graffiti. And when we talk about immigration, a lot of folks don't know, but the first graffiti artist in the history of hip-hop is a young man from Greece named Taki183. And Taki started off by writing his name and the street that he lived on. He was from 183rd. And next thing you know, there was Stay High 149 and Billy 168 and Tony 165 people started putting their names up. And if you think about it a lot of times, when you have a historic moment in which art classes were cut in the Bronx and art programs were being cut, it's almost like a response, or a systematic response to being ignored, saying, okay, well, I'm gonna write my names on your trains, and I'm gonna write my names over here. And slowly it started growing, and to this day, you can see graffiti art take it to new levels. You know, all over the world, um, people are doing graffiti and they've taken it to new mediums with graphic design and you see it everywhere. The other day I rode the train and I was taken aback that the whole train was painted. But it wasn't graffiti. It was a commercial for swatch watches. So other folks have taken note the idea of filling up a train, maybe use it for corporate type stuff. But when we talk about graffiti, it was also the only element 
of hip hop in which you, by practicing it, were putting your freedom on the line. You know? So, once again, with the different immigrant connections, you have the Greek graffiti pioneer, Taki 183. My brother in the front, you got a question? Thank you, my brother. Thank you for that comment. So Definitely. Can you repeat the comment? The, the, the brother is commenting, for those that didn't hear, is commenting on uh, the Five Points warehouse in, in, in Queens that's getting uh, shut, that is getting demolished, essentially, for condominium housing. Again, kind of showing the, the eternal struggle between hip hop and trying to claim space uh, in the face of developers, real estate interests wanting to, to take that over. So thank you for that, my brother, for commenting on that. Uh, Cool. So, raise your hand if uh, your parents immigrated uh, from outside the U.S. Yes. Okay. Sure. Uh, we, we did too. We were, we were from Chile originally, um, and uh, our, our parents were products of the first September 11th, September 11th, 1973, Can I hear uh, you? when the CIA sponsored a coup in Chile, which led to a 17-year dictatorship. Um, now, that's our experience, but Growing up in Chicago, uh, we were around a lot of different immigrant uh, communities. A lot of them were refugees. A lot of them coming from, from conflicts uh, in Guatemala, um, in Nicaragua. Okay. So let's. What, why do people? Why would people be? Why? What are some of your experiences? Why did people immigrate? Why did your families immigrate here? Shout it out, anybody. Jobs for sure. What else? Education. 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 What else? Anybody over here? What? What are reasons for, for families migrating that you feel? Money, okay. Wars, okay. Wars, definitely. Pursuit of the American dream. The American dream. The pursuit of the American dream. Okay. Right, so we can we can say we can summarize it. In, we like to summarize it in, in three quick topics: love, work, and war. Love being, for example, uh, when you have a, one part of the family, say a father or mother, that goes and immigrates, and afterwards wants to bring the rest of their family, right? So reunification of families. Uh, work, somebody mentioned better employment opportunities, and war. Uh, and war uh, being U.S. foreign policy. And that's why I say thank you for that. Uh, that we put this quick graph up. So this, this is just a, a, a simple graphic showing of a U.S. military and CIA intervention uh, throughout the world since World War II. You can add, this is, this is a, a graph that from like 2008 or something. So we're missing the U.S. Uh, participation in the coup that occurred in Honduras in 2009, uh, in Paraguay, uh, a, a coup that occurred as well, an attempted coup in Ecuador, an attempted coups in Venezuela. Um, so we see a legacy after World War II, right, of the U.S. foreign policy leading to a lot of civil uh, disrupt, a lot of national. Now, why, why would the U.S. military be intervening in all in all these countries? What freedom and democracy? What, what's happening? Economic interest. Can you go ahead, sis? What else? Resources. All right. So, if I if I run a factory in the Bronx in the '60s, I'm realizing, man, I can make a lot more money if I shut down my shop and take it to Honduras, where I don't gotta worry about child labor, EPA, OSHA, environmental this, anything, right? Unions. Unions. None of that stuff. So we go instead of shop overseas, and in order for the conditions to be for these corporations to be able to function in these countries, they needed the support of US military, CIA intervention. The result is a lot of displacement. A lot of folks, for example, our families, or families that we grew up with from uh, the conflicts that occurred in Nicaragua, in El Salvador, in Guatemala, in different countries, all right? You talked about the jobs. I, my, worst, my worst class in school was math, so I hated graphs, but we have to do this just to just to quickly show, and this, this is a real simple one. By 1970 to 2011, we see how the manufacturing jobs go down in the United States, okay? Another graph, boom, 1950 all the way to 2010. Two lines, one line is productivity, the other line is wages in the United States. And one of the lines, if you look at it, this, in the 70s, this is the era that hip hop starts in. Okay, so since hip hop started, you've seen 
The flat line ain't no salaries. But wait a minute, productivity's still going up. Okay? So what we've seen in the lifespan of hip hop culture is that wages in the United States have stagnated. They flatlined. That doesn't mean that productivity and profits haven't gone up because indeed they have. But in the life of hip hop culture, we have seen a barely an increase in any type of wages in the United States. All right, so somebody has to be blamed for this, right? Because uh, people are not going to be happy about, you know what I'm saying, increased productivity, more exploitation, and less money for their work. So in the mid-2000s, 2004, 2005, we saw a huge increase um, in attacks on immigrants in the media. So we're going to take a quick look. We're not even going to give these students too much burn. If you could take the volume back up, my brother, please, on the, on the computer. All right?